All right, now in um, Nehemiah chapter 8, I'm going to be focused on the first part of the chapter here. And basically, everything that we that we do here at Word of Truth Baptist Church is based on the Bible. I mean, that's what we strive for. The, the, the way that we operate the church, the way the church functions, the activities we do, everything that we do, you know, going out, preaching the gospel, um, all aspects of this church should be based directly from the Bible. Anything that we do, we should be able to point to Scripture and say, this is why we do this. This is why we sing songs in the congregation all together. It's because of this. It's, you know, this is why everything operates the way that we do. There's scriptural reasoning for it. So what I'm going to explain this morning is the fact that we are a family integrated church. Now what that means, that's kind of a buzzword that's, that's common today among churches. Family integrated obviously just means that children are integrated into our services. We do not believe in segregating the children into a bunch of different groups and sending them off into different classes you know, for their learning and basically splitting the church into multiple congregations. Because if you think about it, a church literally is a congregation. It's a, it's a congregation. People gather together, a group of believers. And when you split up the children, you're starting to split them up. And you're basically just making a bunch of little churches because it's a bunch of smaller congregations. Now, I'm going to get into all of the reasoning here of why we, we believe the way that we do and why we operate the way that we do. And we see here in Nehemiah, in, in chapter 8, look at verse number 1, it says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street. So we see here, all the people are gathered together. And it says in verse 2, it says, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So we see here, in the congregation, there's men, there's women, and all that could hear with understanding. And I'm going to get back to that in just a minute. And it's, he repeats that in verse 3. It says, um, and he read therein before the street. And he's reading the words of the law. He's reading the Bible. Right? He, he, there's this whole congregation. All the people are gathered together. There's men, women. It says, and all that could hear with understanding. And he reads the Bible. And, um, and everybody is in attendance here. And then we see... Um, even as more people are added later on in the, in the chapter here, jump down to like um, verse number 7. It says, Also Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah and Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Maasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Jezebel, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. So it's not, it wasn't just one person teaching. Now, this is a great, mind you, this is a great congregation. Okay, there's a lot of people here. Um, it's all the people. I mean, this is like like all the children of Israel at this time in Nehemiah that were coming back. It's a, it's a huge assembly. So it's not like our assembly right here this morning. You know, we have a really small group of people. But this was a massive group. And it only makes sense. You know, in the book of Acts, as the church grew, they appointed elders and deacons to operate the church around the church. It wasn't just not just a one-man show when you get big. There's just, there's so much going on, there's so much activity that you're going to have more than one person, you know, um, that, that's running the church and, that, and that's responsible, that has responsibilities within the church to teach and to do these things. But you notice when, when all these people were preaching here in verse 7, it said when they were teaching, cause the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. The people were still there. So these people were getting up and teaching. You had different teachers coming up, but every, they were still teaching to everybody. They didn't all break up into small groups. They were all stood in their place. And it says in verse 8, So they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. Now, I just wanted to point this out since we're in this chapter, is that that's, that's essentially what we do. Again, with the sermons, with the preaching, the job of the preacher is not just to stand up and read the law. Because that's exactly what they did here. You know, I mean, they stood up, they read the law. We did that this morning when we read an entire chapter from the Bible. We stood up and read it. But the job is not just to read. I mean, you could get a voice recorder up here and just if that's the only job is just to, to listen to the Bible. You know, I got Alexander's Corbin CD. We could just all sit out and just listen to that, to that be read. No, the job of the preacher is, is obviously it says here to give the sense and cause people to understand that. So what we're doing is we're looking at the scripture, we're going to read it and say, okay, what does this mean? And, and, and the preacher's job is to, is to try as best he can to help you to understand 
what is being taught here in the scripture and just, you know, maybe use some extra words, use some illustrations, use some examples to say, oh, okay, yeah, now I get it. I understand this great truth that God has laid out here for me, but the preacher's going to help me to understand that. And, um, and that's what, you know, and that's, again, the reason why we do this. But if, if this was the only section of passage that we had, the only section of scripture for um, a justification for, you know, for having children in the service, I can see where you'd say, well, no, there's a reason not to, because as we read, it says that there was both men and women and all that could hear with understanding. So some people say, well, see, look, they separated the people who couldn't understand, which would be the really, really, really small children with no understanding. You can say, you can look at this scripture and say, well, no, it removes them. But this isn't the only place that, that talks about the congregation coming together. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. We're going to see much more clearly, um, more clear examples of everybody being in the congregation at this time. Now, again, okay, I'm not going to say it's sinful for a church to have a nursery. Okay, it's not, you're not breaking God's law. I don't believe it's a sin to have that, but I don't believe it's the best way of doing it all. I think that, you know, if we're going to be scriptural about it, we're going to see from scripture that, that that's not how the way things were done, and that's not the way things should be done. Um, you know, so I'm not going to just, just badmouth every church that does this. I'm just explaining why we do things the way that we do them here. Okay, so there's a big difference. You know, we're not we're not going to go out and rail on other churches that might do some of this stuff. This is something for just our the way that we do our practice here at this church, and what we believe, what I believe, is the right way of doing things. Look, if you would, if you're in Deuteronomy chapter 31, look at verse number nine. Deuteronomy 31, verse number nine. The Bible says, "And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord." And unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God, in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Look at, look, pay close attention to verse number 12. Gather the people together, men and women and children and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. So here we see he's commanding them. Moses is commanding the children of Israel, gather everybody together. Get the men. Get the women. Get the children, get the strangers, the foreigners, the people coming in your life. Hey, get everybody together. We're going to read God's law so that everybody can hear and everybody can be taught and everybody can understand. You don't have to turn it. I'll read from you from Joshua chapter 8. We're going to see basically the same exact thing. I'm going to read Joshua 8 for you. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 10 while I read Joshua chapter 8. Joshua 8.33 says, And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side of the ark and on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law the blessings and cursings according to all that is written in the book of the law, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversing among them. So here we see two examples in the Bible that, that specifically point out the fact, you know, one of them Moses was commanding, hey, get the men, get the women, get the children, get the foreigners, get everybody together. And here is saying the little ones. Right? Gather everybody together. You're all going to be grouped together in one place. And if it's important, you think about this logically, right? If it's important for, for the adults, even for the men and the women understanding, to be there, to listen to this word preached, then what's going to happen to the children if you say, well, they shouldn't be in there? Someone's got to be watching over those children. And if someone's going to be watching those children, 
outside of the congregation, not in the hearing of everything that's going on, what about that person? How are they supposed to, you know, they aren't, shouldn't they be as, uh, included in this group of the men and women and everybody else? It's sad, you know, I, I was just out soul winning a few days ago, and I ran into this lady, and she, she was going to a church, and, you know, I, I think she worked nights, and then when she was done, she would go to this church, and she worked in the nursery. You know, and they would pay her to be in the nursery, but she's like, I go, and it's like, yeah, I go for the children, but... She was thankful because she got saved. I gave her the gospel and she got saved. And she says, you know what? I don't ever hear this in church. And she says, I don't hear it because she's in the nursery all the time. She's always in the nursery. She's like, what good is that going to do? I mean, you're going to church and you're not learning anything. You're not hearing anything. You're just always in the nursery. You know, and, and if they didn't separate the children, no one would have to be in the nursery. You wouldn't have to say, you know what? Your job is to never be in church. That's wrong. That's, that's wrong. Now, some churches will do it where people cycle in and out so that, like, at least they're going to church some of the times. But, like, if you just got someone and they're just like, okay, you're just in charge of the nursery. And, like, you're never going to sit in church. That's not right. That's not right. And um, we see here scriptural examples. This is, this is my first point, that there's scriptural evidence that shows that children should be present in the service with everybody else. Now, um... You're in Mark chapter 10. This is very consistent with what Jesus Christ says himself. Mark chapter 10, look at verse number 13. It says, And they brought young children to him, talking about bringing children to Jesus, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me. And forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter there. And so, you know, Jesus is going about and he's doing some pretty important work. Right? And there's throngs of people generally, you know, surrounding him and trying to get to him and talk to him and get healed by him and everything else. Now, there were some people that are trying to bring their children to Jesus. And his disciples see this and they're saying, you know, no, you know, you can't be bothered with these kids. You know, that's kind of attitude. We can't be bothered with these children. we got important work to do. We're going out, we're healing people, we're reaching people, we can't be bothered with these little kids. Jesus rebukes them and says, no. No, the children are important. You suffer the little children to come unto you. You allow them to come unto me. And that's what we do in our church service. You know, because we're family integrated, sometimes there's going to be some disruptions. Right? Sometimes when the teaching's going on, there's going to be children that might start crying. They might act up. They might, you know, make some noises. But we need to suffer the little children. Suffer those things to be allowed. Now, you shouldn't just let your children be a monster during service. Obviously, they need to be corrected. You know, take them out. They're just wailing and won't be quiet. Okay, you can step out for a minute and then come back in. But see, this is how they learn. And they're going to learn how to be able to sit and, and be good in church if they're continually are brought into the service and among everybody else. Jesus said to suffer the little children to come to me. Look, everything that's being taught is important, not just for adults. Everything that we preach from God's word, from the Bible, is important for all ages. Now, granted, maybe they won't be able to pick up everything that's going on in the sermon. But you know what? The more they get introduced to it, the more they hear it, the more, the more that will sink in. And the more that will get down in their ears. Now, um, the churches these days that want to separate the children, all this really comes from, it doesn't come from the Bible. Because we saw already a few examples that talk about everybody being congregated together, and there are zero examples telling us to remove children from service. Zero. There's none. And to the contrary, we see even Jesus saying, no, don't disallow them to come unto me. Bring them here. You know, let them be a part of this. Bring them in. And what it is, it's the world's philosophy that gets mixed into the church. So you have the world comes up with these great ideas, right? And say, okay, we're going to do some public education. We're going to say the state is going to take the place of the parents. You're going to send your kids off to us. So there's going to be one person in the classroom. You send your kids there because we know it's real difficult, you know, managing and raising kids and you got so many other things to do. Just send your kids off to us. 
we'll teach them, we'll take care of them, and it can all be in one group and, and, and whatever else, and then you can do whatever you want to do with the rest of your day. This is the world's mentality. This is, this is what the world has come up with as being a good way of doing things. Then you get a person specialized for just teaching this age group, and you have a person specialized for this age group, and, and you know this is the way that the world thinks. But this is not the way that God has instructed us, and this is not the way that God thinks. God has given us um, you know, responsibility. This is my second point. It's the parent's responsibility to teach their children. God is, when God has given you life, when God has given you children, and has given you that reward, the fruit of the womb, He's also, with that reward, given you a responsibility in teaching and raising and showing that child the right way from the wrong way. Nowhere are we instructed to ship our kids off, but this world's philosophy, that's exactly why you start seeing now the Christian schools, the Bible colleges, all becoming like, they're, they're like these extensions of the church. Now, first of all, the church, there's so, there's so many ways to go off on this. I'm not going to spend too much time on the schooling, but the, the Bible never says anything about, about the church being responsible for raising your children and the church teaching your children. It's the parents' job. Now, look, you bring the children into church with you, because everybody's going to hear the teaching from the Bible, but you don't just send them off to, to classrooms, whether it be state-run or whether it be run by the church. You have the responsibility of teaching your children. Look at, um, turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to see this from Scripture. Okay? I'm going to try to back everything that we believe, everything that we teach from Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. We're going to see just one place where the Bible explains that it's the, it's the parent's job, it's your duty to teach your children. And especially teaching them the Bible. Um, you know, one of the things you get when you, when you are with your child in church, you can hear the teaching and preaching that's going on. And if something said that isn't right, you say, you know what, that, that isn't accurate. You're hearing it with your child. You can make that correction with your child and say, you know what, the pastor said this, the preacher said this, but this isn't right and this is why, and you can, and, and you can teach your child that. If you're not with your child and they're off somewhere else, you have no idea what they're being taught. You really don't. I mean, you might think someone is trustworthy or, or that they're intelligent and they know the Bible, but you don't really know what's, what they're being taught to them. And when children are young, they're very impressionable. And I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself here. But, um, but they, you know, they pick up a lot. And the things that they learn as little children will stick with them for the rest of their lives. So it's extremely important to guard your children from, from wickedness and from evil and even just from false doctrine. I mean, you know, and, and that, you know what that does? That puts a lot of responsibility on you, parent. Yes, being a parent, no one ever says it's going to be easy. You got to study. You got to show yourself approved unto God. And for your children, you need to learn the Bible for yourself so that you can teach your children what it says. And you don't have to rely on other people to teach them for you. Learn it for yourself. Are you in Deuteronomy 6? Look at verse number 6. And this is a commandment. The Bible says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou, thou is singular, saying you, individual, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. It's your responsibility to teach these words, the words of the Bible, the words of law, unto your children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So let me ask you this. If you're supposed to be teaching them when you sit in your house, when you're walking in the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, it sounds like they have to be with you during these times in order to be teaching them during these times, right? Right? It says, if they're with you all this time, when are you going to be shipping them off? Right? It's basically telling you also the importance of you need to be teaching the Bible to your children all the time. They need to be with you. They, they need to hear these truths. It doesn't matter when you're, when you're on a trip, when, you're on a, you know, when you wake up, when you're going to bed. Hey, teach your children. Be diligent. Be diligent about it. Don't just treat it flippantly. Make it a priority in your life to teach your children Thou shalt teach them, the Bible says. It says, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and thy gates. 
God has put the parents in charge of raising their children and teaching them. He hasn't given that response. There's no one in the Bible that says that somebody else is responsible for teaching and training and raising your children. Yet today's world, that's what we want to do. We want to send them off and let someone else deal with it. You know, nowhere in the Bible does it say drop your children off for eight hours a day. Eight hours is a long time to have your children separated from you. Just, just to send them off and say, you know what, you're going to be over there, I'm going to be over here, and someone else is just essentially going to be filling the role that I should be doing in teaching you. And just teaching you all about life, teaching you about the world, teaching you science, teaching you math, teaching you whatever, teaching you whatever. I mean, all of these different subjects, it's, it's all about life. It's all about the world. These are all things that you're going to need to grow and, and be successful. And you're going you're gonna to entrust someone else with your children that they're going to do a good job with that. That's a, that's a lot of trust that you're placing in someone to do that. I don't think that's the best way. And the Bible never tells us that we, that we should be doing that. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, children are impressionable. They pick up on the smallest things. When you start teaching them, hey, they, they're little sponges. They learn a lot. They learn, and people don't give children enough credit for, the thing, for, for what they're able to pick up and what they're able to learn. I'm amazed all the time still, and, and even knowing this, that children can pick up so much, I'm amazed hearing the things that my little girls pick up and that they'll say and they'll repeat and actually have understanding of. Is it the deepest of understanding? No. But even the fact that they understand a little bit of, of some of these, these big concepts and these big truths is amazing to me. Now, um, and this is important, you know, it's not just schooling. Think about anything that you're entrusting your children to be exposed to, right? Whether it be school, whether it be in church, whether it be, you know, the television or the internet or all these other things where there's information being given to your child. You need to know what, what's, what's being programmed into them, especially from things like the television, from, you know, DVDs, from the internet, wherever they're getting information from. Hey, you need to be careful with the information that's coming into your child because they're going to receive that and they're going to learn that and it's going to, it's going to stick. And, um, you know, it's not that all information is bad or anything, but um, you need to be able to help them to discern because they don't know better. Your job is to teach them the right from the wrong. They just see a bunch of things and it's real easy for kids to be deceived and to be distracted and for, and for, for wickedness to be, you know, explained to them, to be, um, to be brought in and introduced to them in a way that just seems real fun. You know, with kids, you get some kind of fun cartoon or whatever, and they laugh and giggle and think it's fun, and there's all kinds of garbage that can just be pumped into their brain that they could, they could learn different things from just because it's presented in a way that, that's appealing to children. Just because it's fun and they don't know any better. And that's why it's important for us as parents, you can spot that. You can say, you know what, no, that's wicked. You're not going to have anything to do with that. You're not going to be sitting there watching a half an hour every single day of this cartoon or whatever it is. Because this is promoting sodomy, this is promoting, you know, whatever. Just any kind of ungodliness, especially these days. You know, it wouldn't shock me. I don't know if it's out there. I'm sure it probably is cartoons that, that promote sodomy. Actually, I heard... Uh, recently some comic books, like an old comic book, like Archie or something, right? Like one of these old, old-fashioned comic books now has come out where, like, there's sodomites in the comic strip, in the new ones, like whatever new ones they're making. Now it's like, there is no end to this, to this garbage, this nonsense. You think, oh, it's just a comic book. I read comic books as a kid, there's nothing wrong with this, and you just give it to your kids. You better watch what you're giving them. You better make sure, that's why every book that we get into this house needs to be approved by either my wife or I before we just go and start reading stuff. Because you don't want to get through it and be like, oh, well, I guess we shouldn't have read that after they've already heard it, right? I mean, that's, that's nonsense. You shouldn't be doing that. You need to be very careful with the things that come in to, to your children's minds. We are responsible. Deuteronomy 32, 45 says this. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2. I'll just read from you Deuteronomy 32. It says um, in verse 45, And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. Again, an admonishment that you shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. That's your job. It's a, it, Moses was commanding his people, you need to instruct your children, you need to teach them to observe all the words of this law. 
It's not his responsibility. It's not my responsibility. It's your responsibility as a parent to raise your children right. Now, this is, is an extremely important point to understand, and this is actually one of the main reasons why this church will never separate the children off. It's because children are vulnerable. They're unstable souls, the Bible talks about. You're in 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start reading. You'll get a little bit of understanding of where I'm going with this when we start reading this scripture. And if you don't, if you don't walk away with anything else... Understand this point. This point can save your child's life if you ever go to a church where they do separate children. Okay? Keep this point in mind. This is very important. Pay attention to this one point. If nothing else in the whole sermon, this is probably the most important point. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1. The Bible says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. This is a promise saying, look, there were false prophets back in these days. Among the prophets, there were false prophets, there were heretics, people that are brought in just to spread lies, just to spread heresies, and he says, they shall be with you. They shall be among you. You're not always able to, dis to, to discern and, and to figure out who they are. A lot of times they'll stick within a church for a long time before they end up being exposed and they corrupt many minds with their heresies, with their false doctrine. Think of Judas. How long was he with Jesus Christ's merit ministry? He was with him for three years, right? A little over three years. Judas was there. He was a heretic. He was a false prophet. Jesus Christ said he was a devil from the beginning. Now, he knew it and he allowed it and there was a purpose for that. You know, but, but he was among them. No one else suspected, no one else knew that Judas was a traitor, that Judas didn't really believe, that Judas, you know, was a thief. They didn't know this stuff. False prophets and false teachers will be among us. What is going to happen if you allow your child to be taught by a false prophet because they're getting separated off in a room and you can't hear what's being taught to them? It gets worse, though. Look at verse number 2. It says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. These people that the Bible is describing here are wicked in their heart. This is not just somebody who's mistaken on some doctrine. This isn't somebody who's saved and, and, and you know, who's trying to save out and they're teaching a false doctrine because they just don't know any better and that's just the way that they've been taught and they're just kind of repeating something and they don't know the truth about it. These people about walking warning us about these false prophets are wicked in their heart. They're out to, to destroy you, to make merchandise of you. They don't have any good will towards you. They actually have evil intents in their heart and they and they fake it. They have feigned words. They say some things to gain your confidence, to make you think that they care about you, but inside they're ravening wolves. On the outside they look like a sheep, they look harmless. They look friendly. Oh, this person's going to be great with my children. Hey, they're great with kids. Look at how fun, look at how they interact with them. And inside it's a wolf waiting to devour your child. Watch out for these people. They exist. They infiltrate the churches. It's promised here. Hey, they shall be among you. All the more reason not to let kids out of your sight, especially for 30 minutes, an hour, however long service is, you just ship them off. Someone else is responsible for that child? Skip down to verse number 12. This is all in context. You can read it later. 2 Peter chapter 2. This is talking about the same group of people, these false pop prophets. Look at verse number 12. It says, But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Hey, the Bible's calling them animals. Natural, this brute beasts. Stupid animals that need to be destroyed. These are the people that are going to creep into the churches. Look at verse 13. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. These people are wicked to the core. They're wicked in their heart. They're, they're, they're eating with you, 
and you don't even know, you think you're having wholesome conversations and people love God and you're having good fellowship and you're enjoying each other's company and these people, it says their eyes are just full of adultery. They're looking at your wife. They're looking at your husband and just, just have eyes full of adultery. You don't know what's going on inside their heart because they're wicked to the core. And it says, while they feast with you, there's spots of your blemishes. Look at the end of verse 14. Beguiling unstable souls. Unstable. They're not founded. These are souls. These are people who are not founded and rooted and strengthened in the truth, in the Bible. Now, could that be adults? Yes, that could be adults, right? That could be new believers. But I think it's even talking more about children. Children are unstable souls. Children are easily deceived. Children are, are easily trusting of people as well. Children, you know, in general, they, they, you know, especially you get brought into a church situation. Hey, we're a church. Everybody loves God here. People let their guard down in church. And they say, oh yeah, that person's from church. Yeah, sure, you can babysit my child. But think of, don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. I don't care who you are. I don't care who the person is. Don't ever leave your children alone with somebody else, especially, I would say especially if they're from church. Now look, it doesn't mean that you need to just be like, like, monitoring as a hawk people in church, like, who's the false prophet, right? I mean, we're, we're not, we're not to be doing that. But here's the thing. You don't have to trust someone with your child. That is something different than just, you know, than, than just keeping your eye on everybody looking for the Judas. You don't need to do that because you, you probably won't even be able to identify them. But um, it's, it's because of that reason that you need to just, for safe, for your child's sake. I mean, think about how much you love your children and how horrible it would be if something were to happen to them. Like, you would, I, I know I would not be able to forgive myself if I were to allow my child to go to someone else's house and they got defiled because I allowed them to go and do that. That is something I would not be able to forgive myself for because it's something that could ruin their life. Just for, I mean, it's just some, that's an event that could happen that there is no making that right. There is no saying, oh, okay, it's not like they fall down and scrape their knee. That's something that sticks with them for life and that can destroy a person's life. I cannot hold myself, I cannot forgive myself for something like that. And you don't want to get deceived into thinking, oh, this is okay, oh, it's not a big deal, oh, so-and-so is a friend, you know. If you want to be wise about it, if you don't let your children out of your sight and don't just let them go off and be watched and monitored by other people, that can't happen. There's no, you're guaranteed a 0% chance of that happening if your children are always in your sight. The more you allow them out, the more you let them just be monitored and, and be under the, the control of other people, completely away from you, and, and you know, broken off into little rooms, and there's little bathrooms and closets and everything else. These things, it doesn't take very much time to happen. You read about it too much in the news. And it's always, always, always people that you think you can trust. Always. It's always the uncle. It's always the cousin. It's always the pastor or the teacher or whoever that defiled these children. And you think about it, and, and both people don't think about it this way because you don't have perverted minds. But it's important to understand this. If, if you were a pervert and you, wanted, and you had a desire to defile children, the best place for you to go would be in a place where everyone's going to think that you're okay, where people have their guard down, where people are going to be trusting of you. And what more trusting places are going to be than church? As I mentioned earlier, you know, people think, hey, we all love God here, right? We're not bad people. We're all good people. So, yeah, of course, I'm going to trust my child to go off to so-and-so's house from church and that they can spend the night there and do everything else. You don't know if they're a wolf in sheep's clothing. And maybe they're not. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that everybody is, but how are you going to know that? And are you willing, even more importantly, are you willing to take that risk with your child? Even if it's a small percent, even if you say there's 1%, are you willing to make that, that gamble with your child, with your child's life? Even if just one, one out of 100, one out of 1,000, I mean, is that worth it? To say, okay, well... 
no problem. I'm not willing to take that risk. That is too big of a deal for me. Now again, I mean, hey, you're a parent, so you decide what you want to do. I'm just explaining the truth that there are people that creep in specifically to churches, of all places, specifically to creep in here, pedophiles, perverts, they know they're going to get access to children. Not in this church they won't. As far as I'm here, they are not going to have any access while we're meeting, while we're in church, within the confines of wherever meeting place we're meeting. I will make sure that nobody is allowed to be separated and segregated with any children in our church. Because I'm going to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now what happens outside is what you do with your children in your own time and, and with your friends and with your family and people that you do, hey, that's your business. But I'm telling you, there are people out there that are wicked to the core, that want to defile children. It's not something we normally think about, but they exist, and they will jump at any opportunity that they have and defile your child. That is the number one reason, and I put it at point number three, but that's the number one reason why we don't separate children in our church. We are a family-integrated church, and most people, the thought never even crosses their mind. Because we've, we've grown to be so completely trusting of people that, that the concern just isn't there when it should be. Now look, you don't have to go around accusing people. You don't have to be, you know, always thinking, like, is this person's child? Look, you don't have to if you already just make the rule in your, in, in your heart with yourself to say, you know what? This is just what we do for safety's sake. I'm not going to allow my child to just spend all kinds of time over here. We're not going to separate them from us. So if someone asks you, you know, in this church, because a lot of times you go out and visit churches. We do it all the time. Um, well, we used to more. When we go on vacation, we'll go to church. And oftentimes it's common. They'll say, hey, would you like, you know, we got a nursery. You know, you can put your child in there. You could, you know. And we just politely say, no, thanks. You know, you don't need to, to start laying into them. You know, that's wicked. Look, they're going to do what they're going to do. You can politely just say, you know what, no, my, you know, my children, I, I want to keep them with me. And if they, if push comes to shove and they're, and they're not going to budge on it, to me that's even worse. I mean, there should be no problem with anybody allowing you to be with your child and want to, you know, no one should be wanting to just take your child from you during conservative. I would, my rule is, if you're not going to allow me to sit in the congregation with my child, then I'm not going to be in your congregation. I'm going to go somewhere else. But again, that's, that's something that I've decided to do because I am not going to let my children out of my sight. I love them too much. I do not want that half a percent or one percent or whatever whatever the percentage is. I don't want that to happen. I'm making it zero percent. Zero percent chance of that happening. And that's why we do things the way we do here. There's one other, the last point I want to mention here um, as to why we have the children in, ser in service and everything else is that... Um, the way a child is taught, the method that they're taught, I believe is also important. And as anyone, I've gone to children's church, I've gone and been separated all growing up. And the way that that operates is very different than the way that service operates in, you know, normal, regular church. Completely two different things. And for a reason, because they're saying, oh, we're gearing this to children and this is geared towards adults. Now, we just went to the homeschooling convention. Uh, this weekend, and there were a lot of people there that are advertising all different kinds of methods for teaching your children. And it's real interesting, There's, you know, they have all these different, um, you know, way, ways of doing it, basically. I mean, there's different approaches, and, and different children pick up things better than others. But um, one method I think that we need to be careful about that, that I've ran into there, it sounds really good on the surface, but um, just not to get too caught up in this, it, basically it's one that allows a child to be restless and to act out and to just kind of be wild. And they kind of teach you to work through that and kind of work with that. And I'm not saying it's what everything that they do is completely bad. I'm not, I don't know anybody specifically and what, what they espouse, but I kind of, this kind of came up a little bit frequently with children and dealing with them. Make sure that you're not neglecting the child's need for discipline. Because this is important. I mean, However you want to teach your children with, with different subjects and things at home, great. You know, I, I, it doesn't really matter, but, but just don't neglect the, the necessary discipline. The problem we have these days is that nobody, people are almost afraid to spank their children or discipline them or just to make them sit still. Now look, I understand kids, they want to have fun, they want to run around, but they also it's important for a child to learn, look, 
you need to at least at some times in your life just sit still. It's an important quality to learn. It's something that, that I believe all children should learn. It's, it's a discipline, it's a form of control of their own body that they can decide and say, okay, I've done this before. Now, obviously with children, there's, there's different ways of teaching them how to do that. Right? You do positive reinforcement, you can do some negative reinforcement, you give them spankings, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do with it, but it's an important thing to learn that you shouldn't just neglect and just say, oh, well, my child is always wild, so I'm just going to go with it. No, they probably need to learn how to behave themselves. So um, just, you know, kind of pay attention to that. But that being said, you know, with church and with children's church, you know, the goal is well-intentioned. People, they design this stuff thinking that, well, we want to keep the child's attention. We want to make it fun for them, and we also want them to learn. Again, I'm just, I mean, it sounds great, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting the kids to learn. There's nothing wrong with, you know, trying to teach them the Bible and stuff. But what happens, I believe, is some unintended consequences with that method of teaching them when you, when you decide to separate them from church for, you know, 12 years or, or 15 years, however long, like, like churches do that. When, you, when a child grows up and all they've known as a child is playtime, running around, this loud music and all, you know, and, and, and people basically entertaining you while you're learning, like if that's kind of the atmosphere, when they grow up, what are they going to be used to? Are they really going to want to go then and sit down in church where the pastor's up preaching and you're sitting down in the pew and it's not that exciting? I believe that this is one of the reasons why these, these fun center churches, these rock concert churches are so big these days. It's because people just want to go and be entertained. They just want to go, they want to sit down, they want to be wild, they want to have this great experience and have all these people playing instruments for you and you have the lights flashing and wow, wasn't that amazing. Church was amazing this morning and then you go home. Instead of, no, we're coming here to learn and sometimes when you learn, you just got to sit still. Sometimes when you go to church, you're going to hear some things. They're not that fun. It's not that cool to hear what's being preached. Hey, it's not that fun to hear that there's predators and perverts out there that are out to defy your children. That's not always fun to hear that. That's not going to be jumping up and down and waving your arms around. But it's necessary. It's important. It's something that we all need to hear. Now, when as, as children, if that's all you're used to, and that becomes what church is to you, that's what it is. It's just a fun time. When you grow up, you're not going to want to be... And, and look, I know firsthand this is the way I was. Children's church, it was, it was kind of fun. It wasn't that bad. I didn't mind going to it. As soon as I got old enough to be in the regular services, I was out, man. I didn't want to be in I didn't want to sit in there. I would fall asleep. I didn't want nothing to do with it. I was used to having all this other fun and playing games and doing all this other stuff. Didn't want to be in church. It's important for children to understand what church is about, I believe, from a young age. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, you'd be amazed what children can actually pick up. And people, I don't think, often give children enough credit for being able to learn during a service. They say, oh, well, the, you know, the pastor's preaching and, and everything's just going over their head. No, it's not. No, it's not. Now, maybe there are a lot of things going over their head, but first of all, the pastor, if the pastor's doing a good job, he's going to be breaking things down in the Bible and not just using all these fancy, you know, words that he learned in Bible college, soteriology and ecclesiology and all these, you know, like, no, you're not supposed to be pumping yourself up, look how smart I am, I know all these fancy words. You're supposed to be breaking it down so that everybody can understand God's word as he intended for it. Say, look. These are God's laws. We're going to break it down simple and say, this is how it applies in your life. This is what he's saying here. It's real simple. It's real basic. And when you're breaking God's word down like that, the children are going to pick up some things. And I get amazed sometimes still. Like my daughter will come up to me after service every once in a while and she'll say, hey, I like that part when you said, you know, thus and so. When, when you were preaching about Ruth. And, when she, you know, and, and I'll ask her some things and she remembers She's listening. They're paying attention. You might not think they are sometimes. They might look like they're just down and they're fidgeting with a pen or something. <laughs> but there's a lot going on. There's a lot sinking down into their minds. Okay, and what they're doing, what we're doing is keeping them in service from a young age. They're going to know what a good church is like. 
When you sit down, hey, sometimes the pastor's going to be up screaming and hollering. Sometimes they're going to be up there, you know, we're going we're gonna to be reading a lot of scripture. We're going to be going through the Bible. They're learning. They're picking up. This is what church is like. Maybe when they grow up, they might move away. They might get married to someone. Some other events might happen. They're going to need to find a good church. Hey, what church are they going to be comfortable with? What church are they going to just instinctively know is the right church? It's going to be the one that they were brought up in. That's going to have some formative, you know, these formative years are very important. Should they just be used to just, just fun and games and jumping around and everything else? As that being church? No, I believe that they should be used to just being a part of service, learning to sit still and say, okay, when we come to church, we're going to dress nice, we're going to sit down, we're going to listen, we're going to be respectful, and we're going we're gonna to hear the teaching of God's Word. And, um, you know, those are just four of the main points as to why, why we are a family-integrated church. We love having the children in church. We encourage that. Um, you know, we, we try to, we're going to try to provide as much as we can for it to be conducive to service so that people can step out as mentioned or whatever as needed. But um, we want the children to learn the children are important to us. The children are extremely important. The children are our future. We need to make sure that we're teaching them and training them right from the young, as young of age as possible so that they can grow up to be godly Christians, godly individuals, and do more for God than we could ever do ourselves. I, I know I thank God for the opportunity that, that even though I got saved a little bit later and I made a bunch of mistakes in my life, I thank God that now at least I can, I can take what it took me a lot longer to learn, now I can start teaching that to my children at a very young age and, and pray to God that they'll, they'll grow up to love God the way I do now, except from a young age, so that they can do so much more with their life than I'm able to accomplish with mine. Um, anyway, so if you ever think about this sermon here, maybe you don't have any children, but um, when kids might act up in church, you know, be like Jesus and suffer the little children. You know, don't, don't get all irritated and offended. And I'm trying to listen to this sermon, and these kids are just making noise. Right? Suffer the kids. Okay, now parents, you know, if your, if your child is just being completely obnoxious and is just making huge disruptions, yeah, you know, step out with your child. But we ought to be able to suffer little children and, and allow that and, and you know, be, be pretty permissive with, when it comes to, to those types of interruptions. But uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for, for the Bible. God, we thank you so much for how much importance you put on the family and on the family unit, just being, being um, so solid in our lives that, that the, the parents are held responsible for teaching their children. Lord, and um, I pray that you would please just help us all to put this into practice and that we would be very diligent in teaching our children, dear Lord, and also very diligent about who we allow our children to be around, the types of influences we allow in their lives, dear Lord, the friends that they have. The, the media that they, that they consume with their eyes and with their ears, and just the, the people that we allow them to be around, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be wise, wise as serpents and harmless as doves, dear Lord, that we would not allow our children out of our sight to be under the care of someone else that we don't know that, that you know, um, we might think we can trust, dear Lord, but that um, we know there's too many examples that have happened where children have been defiled, Lord, I pray that you please just watch over, protect all of our children, Lord, keep them safe from evil. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.